Rex specializes in helping leaders bring out the best in themselves and in those that they lead. He's the author of six leadership books. His most recent, Attitude, The Difference Maker, was just released yesterday. He was the president of two different national leadership development companies before starting his own company in 2003. He believes that effective communication is the key to building and maintaining effective relationships that makes every area of life even better as a result. On a personal level, he's been married for 53 years. Congratulations, Rex. Has two children and two teenage granddaughters. His hobby includes tennis. He plays two to three times a week and reading personal and professional development books and reading, uh, uh, and he reads, he has been reading a book a week for the past 48 years. That's a lot of books, man. Uh, on a personal level, I want to say I've had the opportunity to get to know Rex on a personal level for several years now. Uh, he and his lovely wife have been over to my house for dinner. I've met with him for breakfast and several times. He's a mentor of mine, and uh, he is the real deal. He's, he's truly someone that you could call a guru, so we're really lucky to have him. And for all of those that are in attendance, if you don't get his number and his email and reach out to him sometime after this and pick his brain, uh, you're missing a big opportunity. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Rex. He is going to be speaking on the four essential keys to effective communication. Rex, thanks so much for being here. Oops, thank you, John. The, uh, if you're anything like me, you are drowning in information. You have more stuff coming at you than ever before from emails, from tweets, from other social media, uh, you, you're 24 seven news, you name it. Uh, and your attention span has shrunk. I know mine has. And, uh, the, uh, as a result, we have a lot of stuff coming at us, but this guy is sitting down with lots of information coming at him. So, you know, my message tonight that less is more, and we're going to talk about the four essential keys of effective uh, communication. And uh, before we get into those four keys, my question would be is what does communication affect? And the short answer is communication affects everything, everything. And the, and then the next question is, what impacts communication? And I violate the, one of the key rules of slides by having too many things on here, but I think it's the only way to present this. And that is uh, words and phrasing impact communication, facial expressions, body language, logic and emotion, language and ethnicity, reputation, etiquette and manner, self-image, self-confidence, tone and inflection, eye contact, posture, attitude, gender, pace and volume, trust level, self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. So with all that being said, and with the social distancing and the physical distancing that we have going on, I heard something by T. Simon Bailey. And you, if you want to hear some fun, enthusiastic YouTube uh, speeches, uh, just do a YouTube search on T. Simon Bailey. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me and resonated, and I heard him in... Uh, early, um, I guess mid-February, so was, the timing was great with the social distancing that we're, we've been through and going through. So, the, uh, uh, and what he said is that we need to hug people with our words. And I thought that was great, because I believe that people need hugs, and if we're not going to give them physical hugs, let's give them hugs with our words. So, hug people with your words. Isn't that a cute picture? The, uh, and then he also said, T. Simon Bailey worked for Disney uh, for early in his career, and he said Disney's motto is give people a warm welcome and a fond farewell. So uh, when we're talking about communication, and the way we're going to, and we'll talk about the four keys in just a second, is that we need to, if we give people a warm welcome and a fond farewell, they're going to be glad to visit with us again. So let's take a look at the, the four keys, and then we'll go deep on each one of them. The, uh, the first key is personal presence. Uh, who you are as a person, how you look, how you act, what you say, how you say it. It's your persona, your magnetism, your charm, etc. cetera. Uh, you're confident connecting. And one of the challenges that we have in communication is, is that we think we're communicating a lot of times because we send an email or because we, we call somebody or we leave them a voice message or uh, or we, we give a speech in front of a group, or we facilitate a small group, whatever it might be. But if we don't connect with each person individually and the collective team, we're really not communicating. So we're going to talk about confident communicating. And then 
third is lively listening. And in our rehearsal today, somebody, either Jonathan or Jeremy, said, is that kind of an advanced stage of active listening? And I'd never thought of that before, but that's, uh, that's a good <laughs> idea. I normally, in the previous presentations, have called this empathic or empathetic listening, and, but it didn't have the alliteration that lively listening had. So I, I thought that was fun. That's something new for me. And then the fourth uh, key is rich relationships. And you'll see as we go through here that, uh, that there's a lot of overlap in all of these uh, different sections, that uh, uh, the things that make us, give us good personal pres presence uh, also help us with, uh, uh, with the confident connecting, with lively listening, and rich relationships. But, but let's talk first about personal presence. And I, the best picture I could come up with personal, for personal presence is this one. And by the way, I only have nine slides, so we're not going to... We're not going to have death by PowerPoint tonight. The, uh, so does she look self-assured or what? That, that's, a, that's a neat little girl right there. So uh, when we talk about personal presence, we're talking about poise. We're talking about confidence, self-assurance. Uh, and, you know, that's how we look, how we act, what we, how we look, how we act, what we say, and how we say it. And I'm, I'm going to go deeper on that in just a second. And then the second part of the um, – personal presence is competence that people respond people uh, judge us by our confidence and our competence and our competence is do we have our stuff together do we have goals do we do what we say we're going to do um, you know are we a person of the, our word what have you they um, John mentioned that I I read a minimum of book a week I'll read 60 to 70 books a year and during this uh, non-travel time for me. I've, I'm, I'm about 10 books ahead of schedule. So uh, one of the books that I've read recently is The Trust Edge by David Horsiger. And in there, they, they, have, they have done a uh, study of what are the magnetic traits of people, what causes people to be drawn to other people. And they come up with a big long list of 20-some but they said the number one by a large margin was the person who had magnetic characteristics were the people who showed more gratitude. They were grateful. And one of the challenges I throw out here right in the middle of our talk today, and you may want to write this down, is just before you put your head in the pillow for the next 30 days, try it for 30 days, just write down, even if you're not a journal, a person who does journals or, or any type of ledgering like that, just write down at the end of the day what you're grateful for that happened that day. It might be a person. It might be a thing. It might be an activity. It might be a result. And if it's a person, then I recommend the following day sending a note, an email, a gift, or something, letting them know that you're grateful for them and why you're grateful for them. So that will help you with your, your personal presence. So let's, talk, let's go deep then on how you look, how you act, what you say, and how you say it. Now, obviously, we're mainly packaging. What you see of me, and obviously we're on the screen, is if we were face-to-face, -face, you'd see my hands and my head. 90% of what we do is packaging. And I'm not going to talk about dress for success tonight, but basically we need to be dressed appropriate for the occasion, whatever the occasion calls for. And then once that is over, or once we've handled that part of it, then what we want to do is do we look like we know what we're talking about? Do we look professional? Do we look like we care? Do we look like we're friendly? So we're talking about bearing character, how we carry ourselves, posture, um, facial expressions. Do we smile? Do we frown? Um, and uh, yeah, so all that goes into how we look. And then how we act is, is similar. Do we act professional? Do we act like we care? Do we act like we know what we're talking about? Uh, do we act like we know? I already said that. Do we act like we know what we're talking about? And uh, you know, do we act serious on serious matters? Do we act... Uh, uh, relaxed and comfortable when we're in, in that type of a mode. So how we look and how we act affects uh, how people respond to us. And then the two biggies are what we say and how we say it. The, uh, and what we say are basically the words and the phrasing. And we're going to cover that quite a bit in a, in a couple of different sections. Um, but, you know, there are winner words and there are loser words. And we need to be very careful about the words that we, we choose. And then when we, when we choose, when we put words together and make a phrase, it's even... Uh, uh, more important. You know, the, the one I like to tell is, uh, you know, here's how I normally tell it in a, in a live speech. I say, if, when I go home tonight and Joyce greets me enthusiastically at the door, well, obviously I'm already home, but I'm in my office upstairs and she's downstairs, that um, 
what I, you know, so, but I'm going to, we'll, we'll talk about it anyway. So when I finish this conference and, and we, uh, and I go greet Joyce, uh, my wife of 53 years, and, and uh, I say to her, Joyce, when I look into your eyes, time stands still. Now, I think I'll probably get a good warm reception. But I can say the same thing, just phrased a little different uh, and get a different response. If I said, Joyce, your face would stop a clock, okay? Now, you might think that's the same thing. Time stands still, stop a clock. Obviously, it's not. Now, I know I would never say that, and I know none of you would either. But we say those types of things. What were you thinking? Why in the world? Because I'm the boss. Because I'm the dad. Because I'm the mom. We'll say things, and again, we'll go deep on this in another section. But we use phrasing that... Uh, turns people off instead of encourages them and lifts, lifting them up. And how we say it is the tone and the inflection that, uh, you know, you can just take, you can completely change the meaning of a sentence or what you're saying by the, by the inflection that you use. Zig Ziglar used to use the, the one, I didn't say she stole money. The, uh, if you put the emphasis on the different words, you're going to get a completely different response. So if you say, I didn't say she stole money, your question is, well, who did? Who did say it? I didn't say she stole money, but did she steal? I didn't say she stole money. Who did? So by changing any one of those six words, you can change the complete meaning and, and, and hearing of it. And Stevie, who did a great job last month, I, I was a guest and sat in just to see how this worked. The, she said, uh, it's not what we say, it's what they hear. And I absolutely agree with that. So, but the way we phrase things, uh, our tone and inflection will, will make a difference on what they hear. And then the last but not least is not ver nonverbal. And we're not going to take a lot of time on that now, but the, uh, a, a, a big part of our presentation uh, is nonverbal. And we, you know, we impact people by our facial expressions or our body language uh, more than we think we do. So we need to be careful about that. And then on the other side, the, well, the flip side of that is that if a large percentage is body language, we lose uh, a ton of it. We still can do tone and inflection on the phone, but we, uh, but we obviously can't use nonverbal. So uh, with emails, we lose a lot of our power. With phone calls, we lose a lot of our power. Our, most, our best power is face-to-face. -face. Even in this venue with, this, with the Zoom, you can see me and I can see some of you. I can see Lori, I guess it. I'm not sure. I guess I need to go to gallery view to pick everybody else up. But, you know, we can see each other and have a little more interaction. It's better than not being face to face, but face to face is absolutely better. So that's just a quick overview on personal presence that that people judge us and respond to us by how we look, how we act, what we say and how we say it. How confident are we? How poised are we? Uh, how competent are we? And uh, uh, and then that that splashes into listening and and connecting and, and relationships. So with that, Lori, I am, we are at a natural breaking point to take any questions if there are any. Hey Rex, I do have a question. Um, one of our sayings is that the res responsibility for a message being received properly lies with the sender, right? But what, what, what are some simple ways to make sure that you're actually understood that the message was received? Oh, I know very good. There's some yeah, very good. Well, I think you talked about that earlier in our breakout room. The uh, The key is feedback. That uh, hard to do in this setting with everybody muted. But one of the things I do in a live workshop is I play word association. I say a word and then ask everyone in the group to to write down the first thing that comes to mind when I, uh, you know, when they hear the word. And I won't go into all four words, but I'll give you the one word and go ahead and write down uh, the first word that comes to mind when I say the word I'm about to say. And then what I have in the live session it, where everybody, where no one's muted is I have them say out loud at the same time what it is. And it's hilarious because in a group of 25, 30 people, we'll get eight to 10 at least different things. And, uh, but one always, the one always is a large margin. So go ahead. I'm going to say the word here in just a second. So the, after I say this word, I want you to write down the very first thing that comes to mind. And if you unmute yourself, let's just try and see what happens. I've never done this on Zoom before. But uh, so the word, what I want you to write down, the first word that comes to mind when I say... Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me try it. Everybody unmute. Okay. Or write in the chat. <laughs> okay. Can everybody well, unmute? I'm unmuted. I, I guess you, you could write yeah. in chat if you want, but we need to wait for a response to do that. Go, yeah, you, say it out, but don't, don't say it out loud until I tell you to say it out loud. What I want you to do first is to write down the first thing that comes to mind when I say this word. 
The word is circus. Wow. Ah, you weren't listening. Uh, <laughs> okay. It happens in every group. Okay. We have, we have a, obviously, obviously she's a high achiever. The, uh, uh, so, okay. Now all together now on three, I want you to say out loud the word you wrote down. One, two, three. Clowns. Clowns. Okay, who are our clowns? Me. <laughs> Here are your clowns. Uh, okay, I always phrase it that way just for effect. Because uh, <laughs> usually in any group, it's uh, 20 to 25% of the group say clowns. And they'll say elephants, lions, uh, they'll say fun, they'll say tent, they'll say uh, uh, cotton candy. Uh, they'll say Big Top, they'll say Ringling Brothers, they'll, uh, you get all sorts of response. So the message is, this is a long answer to a short question, the yeah. message is that we tend to think in word pictures. So when someone says a word, we get a picture in our head. So if I'm person A and you're person B and I say X, Y, Z, you may hear X, Y, B, or you may hear something a little bit different than me, and I don't know what's in your head unless you tell me. So the key to, to the quick question and the easy question to answer is that once we communicate out then we say and we don't say one of the killer phrases that i that i um preach against is don't say do you understand because that you know that means i'm smart and you're dumb or uh the uh, uh there's a couple of other not coming to mind right now but anyway do you understand is one of the killer ones instead of saying that say uh what is your understanding of what we just discussed or what is your, what is your understanding of what we need to do next or, you know, what, how, whatever the appropriate thing in that occasion. Does that help to answer your question? Was that John that asked that question? That was sir. And yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We're going to move on to the next section, but let me, let me prime the pump here. The, can everyone see that? That's that's a wow stress buster. It's Nerf, and you can you know you get under stress, you can do it like that. And I have I have a one that says wow, and a one that says awesome. I, I don't happen to have I, this is sort of that thought. I don't have the awesome one on my desk here, uh, but I've got it here in my office. I just don't have it on, on my desk. And for the first five people that answer the next question, the next under the next series, uh, they'll get a either a wow or an awesome, whatever uh, whatever they want. All right, so let's move to confident connecting. And I have no slides for confident connecting. We're just going to talk, uh, talk, talk, sing, sing about that. The, uh, you know, and I, I said it earlier when we went through the four points is, are you communicating or are you connecting? And there's a huge difference. And uh, the, um, uh, one of the, there's four, four additional things. So we had talked about people judge us by how we look, how we act, what we say and how we say it. The, uh, we connect with people when they like us, understand us, believe us, and trust us. And I really believe it goes in that order. And so to have to establish a rapport, and by the way, uh, uh, you know, your relationship building, which we talked about before, is really uh, is uh, continuous uh, rapport, having continuous rapport with somebody. And so it starts with that initial connection. So we need to maintain that uh, genuine rapport. So to get people to like us, the uh, there are you know and you know there are you know Dale Carnegie and all sorts of charm school type uh, and I don't I don't mean that disrespectful but there's things that we can do to get people to like us we can smile we can make good eye contact we can be positive and in this world I think I think just a little side note on what's going on now in the world actually not just America the uh, is prior to COVID nineteen we had three kinds of people we had those that watch things happen those that whine about things and those who are winners so we had watchers whiners and winners i believe after covid 19 we're going to have three kinds of people we're going to have watchers whiners and winners and unfortunately i believe and i don't mean to be cynical here but i believe there will be a larger population of watchers after covid 19 than before because People are on edge. They don't know about the future. They're concerned about the future. They're, they're maybe playing catch up financially. There's all sorts of things. They've been social distancing. Uh, maybe there's some health issues that, that came out of that. And so I think there's going to be a lot of wait and see attitude. And, and for those of us who are in the leadership development business and anyone who's in the business of helping people grow and develop, use more of their potential, we've got a chance to impact those people and help them get through that and help them become winners. The, uh, and in the whiners, we've got to nip it. We've got to do what Andy not Andy, Barney Fife. 
you know, you know what Barney, Barney Fife said? He said, we got, uh, Lori knows, we got to nip it, we got to nip it, we got to nip it in the bud. And so, yeah, we, we just don't want to be around people who are whining, complaining, and, uh, and, you know, those are big downers. So what we need to do to develop more winter behavior is that we need to be positive and we need to be role models for those who are perhaps going through the watching mode, the waiting mode, the, the whining mode. And we need to be role models by being positive and looking for what thing, how things can happen instead of what can happen. We need to remember and use people's names. That's huge. The, uh, we need to make it about them. We need to take a genuine interest in them, you know, not judge them. You know, we need to take off our judges role. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with Cy Wakeman, I believe it is, the uh, she's out of Omaha, Nebraska, the Omaha area, and she te- she she specializes in drama. Uh, she has a lot of long YouTube videos, but if you uh, if you do a YouTube search on Cy Wake- Wakeman, C Y Wakeman, uh, she talks about the drama triangle and and drama. And, and one of the great lines in her, and she's written two books, which I've read. She's written three books. I've read all three of it. The two that come to mind, uh, there's ones down here, no ego. And the other one is, uh, it'll come to me in a moment here, uh, relationship, something or other. But anyway, the, uh, uh, she says in both of those books that uh, when you're judging, you're not helping. So when we judge other people, we're not helping them. When we judge our children, our, our mates, we're not helping them. So we need to help, not judge. And then we need to listen, really listen. The, uh, and then we're going to cover that in the next section. And then we need to be civil, that incivility is expensive. And I don't want to be the old guy that says, get off my lawn, kids, get off the grass, kids. Uh, I like to think that I have, I have, that I'm on a millennial at heart, okay? <laughs> I, I'm not even a baby boomer. My wife's a baby boomer. I'm a traditionalist or whatever you want to call me. My wife's a baby boomer. My oldest daughter, my daughter is a, uh, Gen X and my son is a millennial. So uh, I've got it and they're not at home anymore. And then my two granddaughters are, I guess, Gen Z. The, excuse me, just a second. The, uh, but anyway, the, the one thing I think is, uh, and I got myself off track there, uh, is that, um, help me out here, John. <laughs> the, uh, what was I going to talk about that? We were talking about, uh, you were talking about how we connect, if they like us and trust us, and you were talking about the watcher, winners, and whiners. I yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you. Thank, 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 yeah, thank you. The, um, Cy Wakeman. Uh, what's, oh, Cy Wakeman. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So for, if I'm writing judging, notes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. So if we're, if we're judging, we're not helping. The, uh, and we need to stay off the drama triangle. If you're not familiar with the drama triangle, and uh, there's there's three roles on the drama triangle. I'm not going to go deep on that, but you have victim, persecutor, and rescuer, and a lot of people entered on the victim role. And we need to have a fourth position, and then that's to uh, to ask, what's my responsibility in this situation? So what we need to do is, uh, is uh, to connect with people, is to uh, uh, stay in the moment, wherever we are, be there. And again, just a- answer this rhetorically, but I'm guessing if you're like me, that you can tell when you're talking to someone on the phone that they're doing something other than giving you their undivided attention. They're checking emails, they're organizing their desk, they're doing something, they're, they're searching for something on the internet. And if, you know, so if we can tell that, guess what? They can tell it too. So uh, we need to stay in the moment where we are, be there. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> There's an old commercial, excuse me. The uh, some of the old time. If there's any old timers in the group, uh, I guess that'd just be me and John. The uh, there was a commercial where a mechanic would walk out onto the stage, walk out in front of the camera, and say, "You can pay me now or pay me later." And he'd be holding up an oil filter. And the message was, "You can either change your filter for a little bit of money, or after your engine breaks down, you can pay me a lot of money." Well, I think we'll stay in the moment that way. If it takes us thirty seconds, sixty seconds, ninety seconds longer to stay in the moment it'll pay big dividends in the long run, less hurt feelings, less rework, less uh, uh, turnover, whatever it might be. So we need to stay in the moment. I said before, we need to maintain a genuine uh, rapport. And then we need to avoid destructive behaviors. And we'll close out this section on 
destructive behaviors. Um, uh, you know what? <laughs> I I went I went all the way. I got so far off track. I did the like us, but I haven't done the uh, understand us, believe us, and trust us. So let me just touch briefly on those. That to get people to understand us, we need to clarify and organize our thoughts. But the first thing we need to do is we need to get it clear in our head. We need to be intentional rather than reactionary. Too many times we enter a a particularly crucial conversation. And if you've read the book Cru Crucial Conversations or Crucial Confrontations great books on how to how to confront most of us are reluctant to co confront other people but pause and i don't believe in constructive criticism because i've never felt constructed after i was criticized but i have learned from people when they give me feedback that they they get me to stop destructive behavior and start doing positive behavior so i think you can have positive confronting without using criticism the uh, uh, so what we want to do is want to be intentional. Say, you know, my goal for this discussion is, or what I'd like us to accomplish is, or uh, so you state your intention right up front. My intention is, my goal is, and that gets us thinking and gets the other person thinking about what we want to accomplish. We want to eliminate ambiguity with words and nonverbal. We need to be precise. You know, when you start saying they and them and, and other imprecise words, it, it can confuse it. We need to be specific. We need to avoid jargon. So those are just some things that we can do to um, help people understand us. Uh, just a couple of points quickly on telling the whole truth uh, or, or believing us that we need to tell the whole truth. And by that, I mean, we need to be transparent to whatever point is appropriate for the, the situation. But a lot of times when we don't, when we um, hold things back, it, it can hurt the conversation. We need to admit our mistakes. Uh, all of us have a strong need to be right. So it's, it's hard to admit mistakes, but that, that goes a long way in building relationships and, uh, and in confident connecting. Uh, we need to express with respect, you know, as Stevie said, <coughs> excuse me, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. We need, we need to avoid discounting ourselves. The, uh, you know, I'll hear people start a conversation by saying, this may not be right, or I probably shouldn't say this. It's not necessary. Don't discount yourself. And then we need to avoid parental language. And by parental that again in a live group what i'll do is i'll walk up to whoever's in the front row and i'll start putting my finger in their face and no one likes that and so when we say things like you should have or you ought to or you have to you know that people people get put back it's like putting a finger in your face so instead of and if i say to Lori, Lori, you should have done x y z you should have done such and such you know what what the should is past tense what can Lori do about the past absolutely nothing uh, I always say shoulda, woulda, coulda. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, exactly. Oh, That's well. <laughs> yeah. And so what, but instead of saying you should have, say, well, next time, you know, you might consider this. The, uh, so you talk about the future, not the past. Or you might say, we found the easiest way to do that. Or we found the best way to do that is. So instead of putting someone down, making someone feel bad by telling them they should have, because again, that's like putting a finger in their face. So avoid the should have, ought to have, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Is that, did I say that right? The, uh, and then the last area is a trust us, and just a couple of quick points on that. The uh, you know, trust is earned, not bestowed. I think everyone uh, agrees with that. We need to be real. We need to be open, honest, sincere, transparent, and we need to keep our promises. We need to be reliable. And this is a biggie with me, that, and I think it's a biggie with a lot of people, and that's be on time. And when you make an appointment, a commitment with somebody, whether it's on the phone or on a Zoom meeting or on a on a face-to-face, -face, whatever it might be, no matter who it is, a, a boss, a coworker, a, a supplier, a vendor, a family member, that we need to respect them by, by doing what we say we're gonna do and, and uh, saying what we're gonna do and then do it. And then being on time is a big one. And here's a, a lot of what we do in our workshops uh, are, are, are time is time management. The, uh, and the number one reason, the feedback that I get for people being late is that they try to do one more thing before they leave and they they use the just-in-time concept where they if it takes you 18 minutes to get from here to your appointment you leave at 18 till uh and then you find something to do and then you, you end up leaving at 16 till and you're late and then you apologize and then you're you're judged appropriately so and we want to eliminate gossip and other disrespectful type things and we need to be supportive and forgiving so Okay, now we're going to talk about lively listening. Okay, I might look like I'm listening to you, but in my head I'm fishing. So, the uh, uh, and so that's what we need to be careful about when we and John, to John's question earlier that we may be talking, but they may not be hearing.
And a lot of the points that I would normally make on listening are covered under personal presence and under, under uh, uh, confident connecting. The, um, um, the, Stevie talked last month about uh, the emotional, uh, how emotions affect listening, that emotions will impact listening. And, 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 when, and, and again, during this COVID-19, coming out of COVID-19, post-COVID-19, people are going to be on edge. People are going to be tense in, in some regards and not as relaxed and not uptight. And just the whole you know, lack of hugs and lack of touching and contacting and even high fives. Yeah, uh, the I've been playing tennis uh, for this is the longest stretch in forty some years that I've gone without playing tennis. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens when we get back. Is that we do a lot of high fiving on the tennis court. No more high fives. Uh, the uh, Stevie also talked about not it's not what you say, it's what they hear. Um, uh, what else do I want to talk about on lively listening? Okay. <clears throat> The uh, but yeah, so here are a couple of things on well, more than a couple of things on lively listening is that again, uh, a lot of times we get asked, is, is listening an attitude or a skill? I think it's both, but I, it's really a mindset, and that that we really want to, we need to take a genuine interest in another person. We want to care about them. We want to be curious about what they know. We want to be curious about what we can learn. Uh, we need to know what our goal or intent for the, for the listening might be. Um, we need to quiet our mind. Uh, we need to focus. We need to concentrate again, wherever you are, be there. One of the best ways that I've seen in a face to face encounter to, uh, to focus, to concentrate, to be in the moment is to make eye contact with the other person, to square up and be be square with them. And instead of turning your shoulders or in any way, get rid of distractions. Turn your phone off. Put it on silent. Set it aside. You know whatever whatever is appropriate for the situation. <clears throat> uh, another thing that, and this may not seem like a listening related, but but you have the attitude. How can I help this person? Okay, what do I know that would help them? Uh, what do they know that could help me? And so it's a mutual type of a thing. So I would say all of those things we just talked about fit into the attitude area. And then I have a whole list here, here of things, the techniques, some of which we've already covered. Stay in the moment. See, absolutely. If people ask me, what's the number one, what's the number one thing that you need to do to be a more effective communicator? We've covered a lot of important stuff, but number one is staying in the moment, wherever you are, be there. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing is let them get to their own finish line that some of us are short and terse and to the point and bullet point type of people. And other people like to tell a story and a little more elongated. And what I suggest is that in any conversation, you listen for the period. And even when you hear what you think was a period, you listen to a one or maybe a two count or a three count, a two beat or a three beat, because it may be a comma. You may just thought it was a period and maybe they're going to go on. So if you wait, there's two things happen if you wait for the period and do a two beat is number one, you don't trample on them and, and you let them come across the finish line. And number two is it shows some respect that you don't need a quick answer. Even if you've got a quick answer, it shows that you're a little reflective and it shows them some respect. It's a little subtle non-verbal type of a thing to the question I was asked earlier you want to repeat back or paraphrase <clears throat> i heard someone make this this uh i think it was cy wakeman again she says mute your trained fixer button so we and i think it's a guy thing more than anything i know it is with me is that you know joyce my wife of 53 years if you know if she presents something to me a lot of times she just wants me to let tell me how she feels about it and what's going on and, and what have you. She doesn't want an immediate solution. And when I, when I, so I hear, I hear her, Oh, that's a problem. I'm a trained fixer. I can fix that. And then I fix it. And then what I want, I want some appreciation, man. I just fix this problem. Well, it doesn't work that way. So we got to be careful that if you're, if you're a trained fixer, uh, hit the mute button, hit the, or whatever you call the train fixer button, but you put it on mute. Um, <clears throat> and if you want some of the, open up and, and get curious or a good conversation starter. You know, I was, I'm curious and then ask your question or I was wondering, or would you be willing to consider and you just get people to open up and get them talking. And if they're talking, you're going to do a better job of listening. You want to observe nonverbal cues. Are they in tune with you? Are their eyes glazing over? Uh, I can't see you now. Maybe there's some people now with their eyes glazing over. 
you want to allow for silence? Uh, I've never been in radio, but I know people don't like dead air. You pause for any length of time, which I just did, and people get on edge. They get easy. They want you to fill the dead air. They, they think maybe they're uh, – I ended up on mute. Uh, oh, you saw what I did, huh, Jess? Okay. I, I thought I was sneaking up on you. The, uh, um, now, another thing to eliminate, and this is hard – uh, I attended, I, I, Joel Weldon and I shared, you know, some of you may have heard of Joel Weldon. He, he wrote a book years ago in the 60s or early 70s called Success Comes in Cans, C-A-N-S, Not Cannots. And, and his little thing is he has a little can with a label on it, Success Comes in Cans. <clears throat> and one of the things that he teaches in his workshops is to eliminate I from your speaking and your writing. And man, that is hard to do. But you, you st when you start phrases like "I find," "I think," "I always," the uh, it it can be a turnoff. The um, um, so what you want to do is you want to say "You'll find." Uh, you know, I think it's okay to say if if you're like me. So you're using you instead of I. If, if you're like me, I started the whole session tonight that way. Um, you know the uh, you know you might find so. Use more U's and less I's in your speaking and in your writing. And then one of my favorite uh, favorite phrases, four word phrase, uh, is "Tell me about it." <clears throat> we use it in excuse it. We use it in problem solving exercises. No matter what per people tell you, and if you want them to expand on it, you want to really see where they're coming from. Just say, "Tell me about it." Say, "That's interesting." Tell me about it. Oh, you know, that's a good idea. Tell me about it. And you just get people to to do it. It respects them and you're going to learn something and you're going to get them to open up or tell me more or what happened next. Uh, it just shows that you're caring. It show, caring. It shows you're listening. And then, um, and then lastly, the, uh, uh, what do I have here? I have six pitfalls and we're just going to touch on these quickly. The uh, one is mind reading that I think I know what you're going to say. So I tune out and I don't really even listen and you may shift gears on me. And I, I didn't, I guess wrong to start with, or maybe I'm rehearsing what I'm going to say as a second pit, pitfall is, is rehearsing, or maybe I'll filter that. I'll hear what I want to hear that. Uh, and, and I'll filter out anything else or anything I don't agree with or daydreaming. My mind will start drifting to somewhere else or I'll start, I'll turn on my judging. Uh, I'll start advising or judging instead of doing that. And in my mind, the biggie is one upping. Oh, you think that's something? Uh, and then we we try to try to one up people. So uh, anyway, uh, all right. So here, just a few quick points on rich relationships. Number one is we need to make it a priority that you know business life, business is about relationships. The better our relationships with with employees, with bosses, with uh, those who report to us, with vendors, with the customers, with the general public, with regulators, with whoever it might be, the better our relationships, the better our business. Likewise, the better our relationships in life, personal and other areas, the uh, the better our life is going to be. So, number one, we need to make building positive relationships um, a priority. And Facebook in particular is, you got all these friends on Facebook, hundreds of friends. I just wonder how many real relationships that you have so uh, uh, so when you when you identify your most important relationships in every area of your life <clears throat> just a quick aside I published my memoir uh, last year and <clears throat> I started off whoops excuse me I started off I, I just said excuse me to my mic they uh, start off I started off chronologically you know born here and blah 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 all the way through that's so boring so I, I came into sections and it was really neat and I recommend it to anybody at any age you just look back and and as I look back I thought about all the lessons I've learned and all the people I've met and how person a led me to person b which led me to person c which led me to person d and that my life is richer because of all those relationships so just Look back on your relationships. Um, some of mine were teachers and coaches and and uh, family members and and uh, bosses and coworkers and and authors who I've never met but who I've read their their words. So relationships are good, and we need to make it a priority. Relationships are also continuous. That we can take ten, fifteen, twenty years to have a really great relationship, and we can mess we can mess it up with one stupid act. So uh, don't take it for granted. Um, and one of the things that I think Stevie talked about that last month, and I don't remember how she said it exactly, but we need to give people positive energy that in the book, Celestine Prophecy, the author talks about that we either give people energy or we take 
energy away. And in Tony Schwartz in a book called The Powerful Engagements, talked about the fact that a two minute negative encounter can drain more energy than eight hours of hard work. So we need to be careful about we need to give people energy. We need to be careful about taking it away. I think what, uh, I think what, um, yeah, I think what CV said is that you need to leave people better than, than you found them. The boy scout motto, probably girl scouts too. I, I was never a girl scout, but the, uh, I was a boy scout, but you know, our, the motto in the boy scouts was leave the campsite better than you found it. I think we need to leave people better than we find them. That, that, that if we can encourage someone, show some appreciation, show some gratitude, lift them up, and 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 and, um, and help them see see things uh, different and better, we're going to be better off. And one of the biggies that we can do to establish relationships is help people be right. And I do a whole workshop just on that topic, so we don't have time to go into that tonight. <clears throat> but all of us have a strong need to be right, and it's so easy to the is to quickly push back and say, you know, you're wrong, I'm right. So. You know, we need to come up with phrases that fit us, but things like, oh, you might be right, you know, tell me more, or, hmm, that's interesting, you know, how did you arrive at that, or could you give me a little more background on that, or, you know, I'd like to know what I could learn from that, or I'm curious about, so you, you get people to talk, what have you, and what I discovered, I was in my former business, I was a, I started off as a national sales manager, and I would coach people remote over the phone, and I, I remember Al Wood calling me one time, and he said, Rex, I'd like you to help with a problem, I said, well, tell me about it. And he went on for 30, 40 minutes, 30, 35 minutes, telling me about this problem. He came right around and came up with a solution. At the end, he thanked me profusely for all my help. All I basically said was, tell me about it. So a lot of times, if you let people talk, they'll solve their own problems. So that, that goes a long way in building uh, rich relationships. <clears throat> now, the last thing I want to make on rich relationships is this is a short course in human motivation. And it was taught by Mary Kay Ash, founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. <clears throat> and if you read her autobiography or read anything about her or was ever affiliated with Mary Kay Cosmetics, that you'd know that she used to say that you need to visualize that people have the four, these four letters, these four initials burned into their forehead. And those four initials are MMFI. MMFI. And it stands for make me feel important. If you make the other person feel important, uh, the relationship's off to a good start. So think about ways that you can make people that you come in contact with strangers. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully we have some Whataburger fans today. Whataburger has a Dr. Pepper shake. Whoa, to die for, okay? The, uh, and uh, I've gone through Whataburger three times in the last three weeks. And I get the same thing every time. And this lady on the microphone and the lady that takes my money is so pleasant and so nice and so polite that I said to her today, and it took me three times to do it, uh, but I felt good about myself and hopefully she felt good. I said to her, it was nine, well, I got something from my wife too, but it was $9.45. And as she was giving me my change, I said, it's a pleasure doing business with someone so pleasant and someone so polite. Thank you very much. Doesn't take much. Took what, 10, 15 seconds to say that? I don't say that to brag. I said, because, you know, I should have said it three weeks ago. So, anyway, so make people feel important. All right. So now we need to be positive in a words, tone, inflection, and manner. And hopefully we've touched on that. We need to be open and honest. We need to be an active listener. We need to be in the moment. We need to be kind. We need to treat people with dignity and respect. So now I thank you very much. I appreciate you. You have my contact information there. And here's the free offer in red right there in the middle. And those are my books across the bottom. And that's one of my courses. And my uh, uh, John said in the introduction that my attitude book just was delivered yesterday. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's a fun book. My two best books are the last two, Cultivate and Attitude, both quick, easy reads. Anyway, here's my offer. Since we talked about communication, and I never once talked about asking questions, which is very key in communication. I, I had my, at the result, at rehearsal today, uh, Jonathan or Jeremy one said, We'll direct them to your website to get your free audio. Well, I didn't have the free audio on my website. So I called my webmaster, and boy, he did a really good job of getting it on there. So if you go to my website, www.improve-results.com, scroll down on the home page to the very bottom. There's a link that, that you can click on and get the Art of Asking Questions, which is a live speech that I did several years ago. A couple of dated examples in there. There was about 150 to 200 people in the room. Fun, fun session. The principles are still valid today, even if a couple of the things are dated. I think, like I said, I've been married 48 years or 40-some years instead of 53. Uh, 
but anyway, and then you can click on that link and uh, and download that and listen to it at your at your convenience. And then beside that. Now that was put on my website today. I've always had a little video clips on my website of, uh, of just some snippets from some of my live speeches. And so that's free too. So anyway, so thank you for visiting. <laughs> Absolutely, Rex. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Rex. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Good job, Rex. Thank you.